friends. Thank you for tuning in to History and Law with me, Maritza Grooms, and Robert Ferrant. So on our last segment, we talked about uh, the International Institute and the work that they do there, resettling refugees and immigrants for almost 100 years now. And we had a really special guest, Cheryl Hamilton. We were so grateful to have her. This week, we're going to be talking about labor history again, but with our sister city, Lawrence. Yep, right up the river. Right up the river. So, where should we start, Bob? Well, I think some, some place to start would be those connections between Lowell and Lawrence. And so, when Lowell gets started, and we've talked about this before, but in the 1820s, 1830s, Lowell's not really here. It eventually gets carved out of land that's, that was other towns. The same thing happens in Lawrence. The same investors, largely, who invest in Lowell, they run out of water power. There's only so many mills that can be built in Lowell that the river can support. And so they're looking for other places where they can expand their vast um, textile empire. And so they find a falls similar to the one in Lowell upriver in what's Methuen um, North Andover land. And they essentially purchase it and out of that dig canal similar to here uh, and start building mills. And they're smart. They build woolen mills, not cotton mills. They don't want to mm -hmm. compete with what's here. So Lowell is, is historically cotton mills and Lawrence is largely woolen mills. And so the histories are very much intertwined. Which is, I guess, why it's so appropriate to call them our sister city, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, city. sometimes Lowellians think, well, at least we're not Lawrence. <laughs> um, and I say to people, well, you don't really know Lawrence that well if that's the way you make those distinctions. I spend a lot of time in Lawrence and Lawrence is actually a really great city. I'm on the board of a small high school there, or the board of the Lawrence History Center, and uh, I just find it, I find, it reminds me of Lowell 25 or 30 years ago. The history um, is really fascinating in terms of what happens in the woolen mills to the workers in the city. So is it similar to our history where they started out being paid on very low wages and terrible hours? and I'm assuming like a terrible work environment. In some respects it might have been it might have been worse. Woolen mill woolen mill work by toward the end of the nineteenth century is really um, pretty dangerous. It's horrific. We've talked before about dangers in the Lowell mills, but the woolen mills in Lawrence are really um, tough, tough places to work. Lawrence has the life expectancy if you're a woolen mill worker in Lawrence is barely like late thirties. Oh wow. Um, Lawrence has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the country in 1910, oh, wow. one of the highest mortality rates for kids under the age of five, and one of the lowest life expectancies because of the work and also because of the, of the living conditions. The, uh, the, the, one of the big differences between Lowell and Lawrence is we think of the mills in Lowell and worker housing around them as being fairly dense, but in Lawrence it's even denser. Lawrence ha Lawrence is the most crowded, the, eight, the se seven and a half, eight acres of Lawrence are, are one of the most crowded places in America. Living conditions are really harsh. Wages, not surprisingly, they go with it, are low. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big things in the city is the, the use of child labor, I should say the use and abuse of child labor. For lots of mill families in the city of Lawrence, what keeps them even barely above the poverty level is having their kids work. So people, pe parents will go so far as to work with a neighborhood priest to, believe it or not, falsify their kids' birth certificates oh, to make them appear older so they can work. Because by this point in the early 20th century, there's some laws about up until the age of 14, you're supposed to be in school, and if you're going to work at age 14, um, you can, you can, but you're also supposed to have a note from your school saying you're in school in the morning. Um, and so if you can make your kid be older than 14, even though they might be 11. But again, the, the difference between heat or food or medicine or food mm -hmm. or coal to heat your, you know, your tenement apartment or whatever was, you know, essentially on the back of your kids. And so, um, you know, it's not that people were in love with the idea of doing it, but mm -hmm. it was... It was a necessity. Yeah, absolutely, survival. right? And, I mean, the luck of the draw, if you were from a big family and you were like the fifth or sixth born kid, maybe you would end up not having to do that. Maybe the last couple would be the kids that would be, get to go to school. 
Okay. But if you were the firstborn yeah. kid, um, you were going to be in the mills when you were 12 or 13. The responsibility all falls on that oldest. Yep. Now, the way that the women here were exploited, do we see more of child exploitation in Lawrence, more than in Lowell? You know, they're, they're somewhat similar, but again, because the, the poverty is so much greater in Lawrence, and Lawrence in the early 20th century is attracting lots of Southern and Eastern European immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and the populations when they're coming are a bit less well off even than some of the immigrant populations that are coming into the city of Lowell. And so percentage-wise, there are more kids working. And percentage-wise, as well, there are more women working. I mean, the, the, the workforce in the, in the woolen mills in Lawrence is predominantly women. Men are doing, not surprisingly, the skilled, better paid work. Right. And so you see big distinctions, just as you would in Lowell, between what men make and what m women make. And then there would be distinctions even amongst the men and the women in terms of their nationality. And so mm -hmm. if you were a German uh, immigrant male in Lawrence, you made more money than an Italian immigrant male. Um, and the same patterns would hold true with, with women as well, although women would always be paid less than men. It would be virtually impossible for a woman to make a comparable wage to the highest paid man um, in those mills. It just didn't happen. <laughs> well, I feel like I was just discussing this with my girls at Girls Inc. how this is kind of still a thing that's happening even today. Still a thing. <laughs> equal pay for equal work. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, when, when will happening. that happen? Not for yeah, no, no, another not hundred years? But <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's the thing, right? You talk about this history now and the same with my students at the university. They say, look, they're trying to figure this stuff out in 1910, and here we are in 2018. Um, we still haven't got it right. Right. So, yeah, it's pretty, um, it, it, it's, it's embarrassing in a way in terms of the history of the country that we talk sometimes about, you know, equality and access to opportunity and this, that, and the other thing. Well, if that's the case, why is it always that, depending on your nationality, the color of your skin, or your gender, you know, there are these sharp distinctions between what so-called opportunity really is. You know, if you're a woman worker in the mills in Lawrence, you had an opportunity to make this much. Mm -hmm. If you were a man in the mills in Lawrence, you had an opportunity to make this much. And that's, that stayed constant. Yeah. So I imagine people were not happy about this. Again, sort of the, the murky areas of history and labor history in the country, to the shame, I think, of organized labor is that while women had these difficult conditions, men, like new immigrant males, also were working under really harsh conditions. Mm -hmm. And the, again, the wage distinctions um, were there for them as well, but still women were paid less. But there were labor unions in Lawrence. However, they only wanted to organize skilled male workers and skilled male workers who they defined as white meaning they, was, they weren't Southern or Eastern European immigrants, nor were they African American. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you would have organized in Lawrence plumbers, electricians, people that built machinery, things like that, but the vast majority of the workers were unorganized. And mill owners relied on that, and they relied on the pecking order, if you will, of playing people off one against the other by mm -hmm. paying one group a little bit more than another. Well, at least you're better than they are. Right. Um, what are you complaining about? And so mill owners thought as we move into the 20th century and workers around the country begin to try to figure out how to organize themselves that, well, we don't have to worry about that happening in Lawrence because there are, these, because there are some 30 nationalities living in the city. There are all the languages, mm -hmm. cultures, religions, everything that goes with all that that the thought was workers would never be able to organize themselves. So they relied on their differences to keep them separate. Yeah, yeah, they there. exploited the differences, absolutely. Right. Um, and they, in, from the mill owner's perspective, they enjoyed the differences mm. because in their minds it would mean they would never have to worry. So trade union organizers fully believe, the same way in Lowell, when we've talked about Lowell's mm -hmm. labor history with the young women in the mills before the Civil War and such, union organizers never thought women would organize. Well, they didn't think that the women were smart enough anyways to know. Smart enough and or, and what went, what went with it was, well, they're not going to stay working for long, mm -hmm. right? They're going to have babies and then they're going to drop out of the workforce. But if you were a mill worker, a female mill worker in Lowell, or a female mill worker in Lawrence, 
quickly after you had a baby, you went back to work because you needed the money. You had to. You there have another There is no maternity <laughs> leave. There is nothing that's going to sustain people. Not right. And now you have another mouth to feed. So, feed. so if you were lucky in your tenement block, you know, there was somebody's grandmother in the building who would, like, take all the kids. Yeah. Um, and you would sort of have, you know, you would have that kind of, you know, family daycare. <laughs> um, but without all the legalities that we have today. Right. And it would just be, that's what would happen. And then you would go out to work. And that's what people did. So the idea that women would not um, keep working was a myth. Um, and so as, we, so as we move into the 20th century... What starts to happen in mill cities around, not just in Lawrence, but around the country, um, is a new labor union shows up called the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW. And the Industrial Workers of the World has a completely different philosophy about organizing than does the American Federation of Labor, which is only organizing largely skilled white guys. Right. Um, the Industrial Workers of the World says if you work we're going to organize you. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter um, the kind of work. It doesn't matter where the work. Uh, we want to organize you. And they're particularly sensitive, and this plays well in Lawrence and in Lowell. The IWW is active here, too. Um, it plays well to the immigrant populations because they, they understand those differences, and they say, we're going to work to overcome the differences rather than let the differences fester and divide workers, mm -hmm. we're going to essentially say, look, we can, we're all in the same boat. Uh, we have to figure out a way to overcome language, religion, food, whatever it is, church, um, and pull together because the main obstacle to us having a better life are the people that own and operate the mills, not mm -hmm. Italian workers to Greek workers or Polish workers to Portuguese workers. We're all workers. We're all in this together. And so they're building this sort of out of the sight of the mill owners, they're building this very sort of grassroots organization in all the different neighborhoods in the city of Lawrence uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, so between 1900 and 1910. Wow. And I'm assuming, I'm just thinking, they're working these crazy hours, so on their very limited free time, this is what they're doing. They're mm -hmm. organizing, yep. and they're, they're, demand, they're deciding what their demands are. Yep. And, and how, how did they all get together? Like, Well, one of the, I mean, again, sort of the obstacle in a way is obviously different languages, right? right? So if we were working in the same mill in Lawrence and you spoke Greek, let's say, and I spoke Portuguese, okay, well, how are we going to commiserate? Yeah. How are we going to? And so they essentially started building first language organizations. So they would organize into a industrial workers of the world local, let's say all Greek workers or Portuguese workers or Polish workers, so everybody in a room could talk to each other. And then out of those various language groups, they would send two or three people to this larger meeting that would be like the United Nations of Lawrence workers, where there would be you know, all languages represented, and there would be translators, and there would be people that could make sure everything could be communicated back and forth. And so as they're organizing, they're making a pledge to all the workers in the city that should anything happen, should there at some point, and they, they're not thinking yet there's going to be a strike like there is in 1912, which is where we're heading this morning, but, or this afternoon, or whenever you're watching these people <laughs> out there in TV land. Um, they, they assure each other that if there's something that happens, everybody will communicate with each other um, in all the different languages. Nobody's going to go off in secret and make a deal. Um, and they commit to that. And so that begins to build this broad-based organization. And eventually they have like a 50-person steering committee wow. of all these industrial workers of the world locals, of which there are like almost 15 or 20 of them in Lawrence by 1910. Wow. In Lowell, there are, there are an equal number. They've done the same thing in Lowell along the way. But so what happens is in... The earlier 20th century, 1910, I think, the, the Massachusetts legislature has passed a law to shorten the legal work day, right. uh, work week, excuse me, from 58 hours to 56. We think that's shortening it, right? <laughs> 58 to 56 goes into effect, and when it does, workers' wages aren't cut. Everybody still makes the same pay as though they were working for 56, but now they're 
working for 54. The legislature does the same thing again, and effective on January 1, 1912, mm -hmm. the, the work week is going to be cut for women and kids from 56 hours to 54. And so they know a year ahead of time that on January 1, 1912, that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so they go to the mill owners in Lawrence and they say, when this happens, is our wa are our wages going to stay the same or are you going to cut them? And the mill owners won't tell them. Mm. So they're not dumb and they figure out, well, if it was good news, they'd tell us. Right. And so this is obviously <laughs> going to be bad news, right? So in the run-up to January 1, 1912, all across 1911, they're planning, if, in, if indeed on that first day, first payday in January of 1912, our pay's cut, what are we going to do? Right. And so in, that, in those rooms where all those locals are meeting and then in the big room where the larger group, you know, the, the, the Rainbow Coalition, if you will, is meeting, they basically say, if we're paid and our wages are cut, we're all going to walk out. And the mill owners don't, I mean, maybe they have some inkling of what's going to happen, but they're not, they don't really know for sure. And so on that first payday, the first workers are paid on January 11 of 1912. Um, Polish workers in the Everett Mill, women workers in the Everett Mill get their pay, and it's short. And they, in fact, shut off their machines and walk off the job. Awesome. And they start marching around the mill district in Lawrence, yelling up, into the windows of all the other mills, short pay all out. And they're saying it in Polish, but I'm not going to even attempt it. <laughs> um, and eventually, the next day, when everybody else is paid, the same thing happens. Um, and on that Thursday and Friday, so upwards of some 20, 25,000 people walk out wow. of the mills and walk off the job. And shutting down these places, right? Shutting down the largest producer of wool cloth in the United States. Wow. Well, so yeah. that's not a good look for anybody right now. <laughs> well, and so they, the mills are silent. Um, the mill owners are quoted in the newspapers that Saturday. They're just blowing off steam. They'll be back to work on Monday. Oh. Uh, Monday comes and they're not back to work. So how long is it before they return? They stay out on strike until nearly the end of March. Wow. Wow, so in the it, coldest month in It's winter time, um, and when I talk to my students about this, I say, and let's be really clear here, these, these are workers that live check, not, they don't get paid in a check, they get cash. Right. They basically um, live from cash pay envelope to cash pay envelope. They don't have banking accounts. No. They don't have parents that can subsidize their tuition. They don't have credit cards. Um, they're living week to week, essentially. Mm -hmm. And now they've taken this brave and bold step, uh, which I think it was, to Absolutely. basically say, uh, we can't live the way uh, you want us to live. We need better wages, safer working conditions, better housing, um, et cetera. And so they organize themselves, and again, the mill owners are banking on the differences between mm -hmm. men and women, between nationalities, uh, and, but the ranks basically hold. The people united will never be defeated. Yeah, well, in this case, <laughs> it bear, it, that slogan is borne out in this particular instance, no question. Wow, that, yeah. is, that is really, that's, you don't see that kind of passion and dedication and, and sacrifice, because there are times where people are like, well, I have to eat. So right. I can't just walk off of my job right now. And yeah, you and see that I mean, now. you're right, right? And I, so, I mean, I try to, I, when I'm, again, when I'm teaching this um, at UMass Law, I try to get my students to imagine what it must have been like in Lawrence on January 10 of 1912 when workers who are going to get paid the next day are thinking, okay, what are we going to do? Yeah. And so all around the city, I mean, the commitment is made, but sometimes people make a commitment and then when you know, the rubber hits the road, push comes mm -hmm. to shove, it's like, they, I can't do it, right? For the reasons that you just said, I need, I, I need food for my yeah. kids. I can't do this, right? I just had a snowstorm. I need to get yep. coal. <laughs> and so what if, so right, I mean, what if that first group of Polish women workers, you know, on January 11 didn't shut their machines down, just continued to work? Would everything have fallen apart? Um, who, who the heck knows, right? right? But on the other hand, the bravery, if you will, of the first people that did it, and so now they're out on strike, 
And the mill owners now realize after a few days, maybe they're not coming back. And so what the mill owners now do is get through the state legislature and the governor of Massachusetts, the sending in of what would, we would think of today as the National Guard, or what back then was the state militia, oh, wow. to police the strike and try, if it's possible, to keep the, the gates open to the mills, push people away who are trying to keep any workers who might want to come in out um, and essentially try to op reopen the, open the mills. And so this leads to several pretty dramatic clashes between strikers um, and the militia. And there are these incredible photographs of the militia with rifles with, you know, this long bayonets on the end of the rifles, prodding workers. Um, they make it illegal, uh, in the city, they make it illegal for workers to mill around in front of factory gates. And a lot of the mills in Lawrence, there are these bridges over the canals to go into the mill. And they're maybe 15 or 20 feet wide. And so it would be easy for a handful of workers to sort of stand there and block anybody from getting in. And so they make it illegal to do that. Wow. Um, so they're trying anything they can do to break the will um, of the strikers. But again, what they're not banking on is this community solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and so they make it illegal to stand still in front of the, on those canal bridges. And so now what workers decide to do is, okay, well, if we can't stand still, we can march. And so each day there's like four or 5,000 workers. Wow. And they march really close together in tight ranks, very, very slowly. So they're taking baby steps, but they're moving, <laughs> right? And they're Loophole. moving back and forth in front of the gates, but they're moving. Wow. And so the law said they couldn't stand still. They're not standing still. And what's funny is they, they're also singing. Oh, right? And so we know this because the articles in the papers about the strike, they, they interview the militia and the militia, are, these people are nuts. <laughs> they sing all day. <laughs> right? And like they're befuddled. They don't know what to do because people are singing. And it turns out that what people are doing is singing in everybody's language. Oh, so wow. people learn songs in French or Polish or Greek or German or Lithuanian, oh, you know, wow. or whatever it is. Um, and so they learn each other's songs, and it's another way to sort of, you know, mesh mm -hmm. together. And it is, e if you think about learning languages, it's easier to learn how to sing something. Mm -hmm. You might not necessarily even know what you're singing, but you can <laughs> sing it, right? Exactly. Um, and so that's what they do. And so now they're marching and singing, marching and singing, marching wow. and singing, driving the mill owners and the militia crazy. Um, and it's highly effective, and so the, the ranks continue to hold. Wow, that is, that's just a beautiful showing of true solidarity. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm, I really like, I mean, I've written two books about the strike because <laughs> I really like the strike. Yeah. There are a lot of lessons for today. Definitely, and especially with so many different immigrant groups. It's not even like how we had just one or two. There are many different groups. Oh, boy, this is, groups. yeah, there's like 30 different, 30 different nationalities in the city. That is, that's you have Syrians, you have Lebanese. Wow. You have Poles, Greeks, Italians. Yeah, you name it, it's there. So how did, how did it come to be known as the Bread and Roses? In 1911, there's this, po there's this poet named Oppenheim who writes a poem called Bread and Roses, right? But it's written before the strike even happens. Oh, wow. It's written in 1911. And he publishes it, so we know. And then in 1912, he comes to the strike. He's like a journalist and whatever, and so he witnesses the strike, and then he re-releases the poem and says the poem came from the, the Lawrence strike, and so, uh, which isn't true. Right. There's no evidence that, that anybody in the strike carried signs that said, we want bread and roses or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But he kind of grafts the poem, Bread and Roses, onto the strike, even though he wrote it before the strike even happened. And so, in the history of the strike, after the, after the strike is over, um, the the Catholic Church in Lawrence, the police, the mayor, would just assume the history of the strike goes away and the sort of record of Lawrence as being the place where the strike happened to go away. And so they have in October of 1912 something called the God and Country Parade oh. to sort of talk about, well, there were good immigrants and bad immigrants oh. and the bad immigrants were in the strike and the good immigrants <laughs> are the Irish Catholics and French Canadian Catholics and whatever and, and right and so the history of the strike kind of goes underground and people somewhat forget about it oh, wow. uh, and people who are involved in the strike in Lawrence don't even talk about it they don't talk to their kids their grandkids nobody oh, wow. 
Wow. And so 50 years later, in 1962, the 50th anniversary, rather than celebrate the strike, they celebrate the God and Country Parade in Lawrence. And it's at the height of the Cold War in America. Mm. We've just had the Cuban Missile Crisis and all the other stuff. And so it's very much like an anti-communist, um, anti-labor, um, pro-America um, march in Lawrence in, in 1962. But a few years later, in the 1970s, we've now had sort of the burgeoning of the women, sort of like a rebirth of the women's movement okay. and a more of an interest on college campuses and women's history, labor history. And so some people delve back into and sort of resurrect the strike. Um, and they sort of put the moniker on it of Bread and Roses. And folk singers Mimi Farina and other people take the poem and put it into music. Um, Joan Baez, other people perform it, and the strike starts to be much more thought of as the Bread and Roses strike. But, it, but in a way, it's very, it, it, it's, it's this, you know, Oppenheim poem that was written in 1911 before the strike wow. even happened. Wow, almost like a, a prophecy. If you <laughs> yeah, no, it's very weird, right? I mean, he was a skillful marketeer, I guess, and he got a lot more mileage when he re-released the poem and came right. a bit more famous as a poet. But what's really, I mean, the, a couple of interesting things about the history of the strike. Usually the way the strike is taught, it's taught as it was this very spontaneous thing, right? All of a sudden people got upset when their pay was cut and they walked out like magic, right? And the problem with that is from a historical standpoint is it, it negates the importance of neighborhood organization, grassroots right. organization, organization block to block, and organization across you know, a variety of immigrant groups, languages, and such. And so, it, so the people that teach it that way do a disservice to the importance of the history of the strike, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why I wanted to like write more about it and learn more about it. Because it, th it, it never makes sense to me that somehow 30,000 people walk off the job like poof. Right. Yeah, it just doesn't happen, right? It's, un it's not realistic. And even if that happened in a flash, it wouldn't have lasted exactly. for 11 weeks. Right, so there had to be more to it than than sort of the the classical textbook version. The other thing about the strike that's fascinating is because of the fact that it was an immigrant city, workers from the different countries that ended up in Lawrence had their own radical labor organizing traditions, which they brought with them when they ended up in Lawrence to work in the woolen mills. So once the strike began. Two dramatic things happened. One was this group of Franco-Belgium workers who in France and Belgium, in the border region, that's why they were called Franco-Belgians. Anyway, they, they, have a tra they had a tradition of worker co-ops, which they brought with them. So even before the strike, they had, a, they had a hall in Lawrence and they basically could feed people, right? So they did. The second thing was they brought with them a tradition of sending, like, sending kids out for safekeeping during a strike, which they did. And so basically that's what won the strike. By being able to send their kids away to be taken care of and be safe, they could prolong the strike more than they might have otherwise. Wow. I, you know, sometimes I wish that we had so much more time. We need three hours. I know, we do. And, and I think that people would stay and watch because this is compelling <laughs> stuff. And when you look at how everything is all connected, and again, our overarching theme of community, and people working together, and that's really what gets things done. And I think that Lawrence and Lowell have that in common, where mm -hmm. we all band together, no matter scrappy place. Exactly, scrappy places, and we and we know how to work together to get what we need mm -hmm. and to get where we need to go as a people. I think that we we can call ourselves role models for the yes, rest of the country. We'll take it. <laughs> So thank you so much, Bob, once again, for educating us on this incredible history and really incredibly complex way that people work together and bringing to light the things that need to be known so that we can go forward and make better decisions for our own futures, right? Let's hope. Let's hope. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope that you come back next time for History and Law.